All right, here we go. Chapter 9 of Cancer Ward by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Read to you by Carter Banks. Chapter 9. Tumor Cordis. Yevgenia Ustinova, senior surgeon, had some of the traits usually ascribed to members of her profession. None of the resolute look, determined lines across the forehead or iron clenching of the jaw, and her appearance as a whole lacked the straightforward wisdom. Although already in her fifties, if she piled her hair on top of her head inside her doctor's cap, men who saw her from behind would call out, Excuse me, Miss, uh... She was, as the saying is, a young pioneer from behind and an old age pensioner from the front, with her drooping lower eyelids, pulled up eyes, and perpetually weary looking face. She tried to make up for this by using lots of bright lipstick, but she had to put it on more than once a day, because it always rubbed off on the cigarettes she smoked. Every morning, she was not in the operating theater, the surgical dressing room, or the ward. She had a cigarette in her mouth. She would seize every opportunity to dash out and fling herself on a cigarette as though she wanted to eat it. During her rounds, she would sometimes raise her first two fingers to her lips, so one might perhaps argue that she smoked even during her rounds. Apart from the chief surgeon, Lev Leonidovich, a very tall man with long arms, this aged, stringy woman did all the operations in the clinic. She sawed off limbs, put tracheotomy tubes into the wall of the throat, took out stomachs, penetrated to every part of the intestines, plundered the inside of the pelvic girdle and toward the end of the day's operations, it might fall to her lot to remove one or two sets of cancerous lacteal glands. An uncomplicated job that she had mastered like a virtuoso. There was never a Tuesday or a Friday on which Yevgenia Ustinova did not cut off women's breasts, and she would remark to the orderly who cleaned the theater, a cigarette between her exhausted lips, that if all the breasts she had cut off were collected together and made into a pile, the result would be quite a small mountain. Yevgenia Ustinova had been a surgeon all her life. Without surgery, she would be nothing. Still, she remembered and understood the words of Tolstoy's Cossack, Yeroshka, who said about West European doctors, all they can do is cut. Well, they're fools. But up in the mountains, you get real doctors. They know about the herbs. And if tomorrow some other kind of therapy were invented, radiation, chemical, or herbal, or even something worked by light, color, or telepathy, which could save her patients without the knife and surgery would completely vanish from human practice, Yevgenia Ustinova would not have defended her craft even for a day, not because of her convictions, but simply because she had spent all her life cutting, cutting, all her life had been blood and flesh. It is one of the tiresome but unavoidable facts of humanity that people cannot refresh themselves in the middle of their lives by a sudden, abrupt change of occupation. They would usually go on their rounds in groups of three or four, Lev Leonidovich, she, and the interns. But a few days ago, Lev Leonidovich had gone to Moscow for a seminar on thorax operations. For some reason, this Saturday she was quite alone when she went into the upper men's ward, without an attendant physician or even a nurse. She didn't go right in. She just stood quietly in the doorway, leaning back against the door with a girlish movement. A very young girl 
can lean against a door and know it looks good. Better than standing with a straight back, level shoulders and a head erect. She stood there pensively, watching Dionka playing a game. Dionka had his bad leg stretched out along the bed, and the foot of his good leg laid under it to make a little table. On this, he had placed a book, and on the book, he was making something out of four long pencils, which he held in both hands. He was contemplating this figure, and seemed likely to go on doing so for a great while. But just then, he heard someone call him. He raised his head and gathered the splayed pencils together. What are you doing, Dayomka? Yevgenia Ustanova asked him sadly. A theorem, he answered cheerfully, louder than necessary. Those were the words they used. But the looks they gave each other were keen, and it was clear that they were really concerned with something quite different. Time's slipping away, added Dayomka, by way of explanation, but not so cheerfully or loudly. She nodded. She was silent for a moment, still leaning against the doorway. No, not girlishly, but through sheer tiredness. Come on, let me have a look at you. Dayomka was always quite mild, but this time his protest was livelier than usual. Ludmila Afanseyevna examined me yesterday. She said we'd carry on with the radiation. Yevgenia Ustinova nodded. There was a sort of sad elegance about the way she looked. Well, that's good, but I'll still take a look at you. Dayomka frowned. He put away his stereometry, drew himself up in the bed to make room, and barred his bad leg to the knee. Yevgenia Ustinova sat down beside him. Without effort, she jerked up the sleeves of her coverall and dress almost to the elbow. Her slender, supple hands began to move up and down Dionka's leg like two live creatures. Does it hurt? Does it hurt? She kept asking. Yes, yes it hurts, he confirmed, frowning more and more. Can you feel your leg during the night? Yes, but Ludmila Afanseyevna... Yevgenia Ustinova again nodded her head understandingly and patted him on the shoulder. All right, my friend, carry on with the radiation. And once again, they looked into each other's eyes. The word had fallen quite silent. Every word they spoke could be heard. Yevgenia Ustinova got up and turned to the others. Proshka should have been in the bed over there by the stove, but yesterday evening he had moved to the bed by the window, even though there was a superstition against taking the bed of someone who had left the ward to die. In the bed by the stove there was now a short, quiet man with flaxen hair called Friedrich Fedoral. He was not an entirely new face in the ward, since he had already spent three days lying out on the staircase. He stood up, thumbs down the seams of his trousers, and gave Yevgenia Ustinova a glance of welcome and respect. He was not as tall as she was. He was in the best of health. He had no pain anywhere. The first operation had completely cured him. He had reported back to the cancer clinic, not on account of any complaint, but because he was so exact in everything he did. It was written on his certificate, checkup on February 1st, 1955. And so he had come hundreds of miles across difficult roads and via awkward connections, first in a sheepskin coat and felt boots in the back of a truck, then from the station to here wearing shoes and a light overcoat, and arrived not on January 31, nor on February 2, but with the exact punctuality with which the moon reports for her scheduled eclipses. He didn't know why they had put him back in the hospital. He very much hoped that they would discharge him today. Up came Maria, 
tall and dried up, with dead-looking eyes. She was carrying a towel. Yevgenia Ustinova wiped her hands and arms, raised them, still bare to the elbows, and in complete silence massaged Federal's neck for a long time with circular movements of her fingers. Then she told him to undo his jacket and continued the movement around the hollows of his collarbones and under his arms. Finally, she said, Very good, Federal. As far as you're concerned, everything's excellent. His face lit up as though he had been given a reward. Everything's fine. She drew the words out with affection and again worked her fingers under his lower jaw. One more tiny operation and that'll be it. What? Federal's face fell. But why, Yevgenia Ustinova? If everything's fine, it'll make you even better. She smiled faintly. Here? He brought his palm down with a cutting movement diagonally across his neck. There was a look of entreaty on his soft face. That might be entreaty. A look of entreaty on his soft face. His eyebrows were fair, almost white. Yes, there. But don't worry. Yours isn't one of those neglected cases. We'll get you ready for next Tuesday. Maria made a note. And by the end of February, you'll be home for good, and you'll never have to come back here. Will there be another checkup? Federal tried to smile, but did not succeed. Well, perhaps a checkup, she smiled apologetically. What else could she use to reassure him, if not her tired, weary smile? She left him standing there, and then he sat down and began to think. She moved on across the room. As she passed Amazhen, she gave him another of her slight smiles. She had operated on his groin three weeks ago. She stopped when she came to Yefram. He had already thrown down the blue book he was reading and was waiting for her. With his broad head, his neck bandaged and fattened out of all proportion, his wide shoulders, his legs pulled up and under him, he was sitting up on the bed like some kind of improbable dwarf. He looked at her sullenly, waiting for the blow. She leaned her elbows against the rail of his bed and held two fingers to her lips, as though she were smoking. Well, what sort of mood are we in today, Podiev? Hadn't she anything better to do than stand around jabbering about moods? All she had to do was say her little piece and go. She just had to do her act. I'm fed up with all this cutting, Yefram blurted out. She raised her eyebrows, as if surprised that cutting could make anyone fed up. She did not say anything, and he had already said quite enough. They were both silent, like two lovers after a tiff or before a breakup. The same place again? It wasn't even a question. It was a statement. He wanted to shout, What did you do before? What were you thinking about? He was never very delicate when it came to dealing with bosses. He always jumped down their throats, but he spared Yevgenia Ustinova, let her guess for herself how he felt. Right next door, she made the slight distinction. Poor devil, how could she tell him that the cancer of the tongue is not cancer of the lower lip? You take away the nodes under the jaw, and suddenly it turns out that the deep lymphatic ducts are affected too. She could never have operated there earlier on. Yefram grunted, like a man pulling a weight too heavy for him. I don't need it. I don't need it at all. She did not try to talk him around it. I don't want any more cutting. I don't want anything anymore. She looked at him in silence. Discharge me. She looked into his reddish eyes. They had gone through so much fear that now they were quite fearless. And she too thought, why? 
Why torment him if even the knife can't keep up with his secondaries? We'll unbandage you on Monday, Podiev. We'll see, all right? He had demanded his discharge, yet he had desperately hoped she'd say, You're out of your mind, Podiev. What do you mean, discharge you? We're going to give you treatment. We're going to cure you. But she agreed, which meant he was a goner. He made a movement of his whole body to indicate a nod. He was unable to do it with his head alone. She went on to Proshka. He got up to meet her and smiled. She did not examine him at all. She just asked him, Well, how are you feeling? First class. Proshka's smile broadened. These tablets have really helped. He pointed to a bottle of multivitamins. If only... He knew how to soften her up. If only he could persuade her. She mustn't even think of an operation. She nodded toward the tablets. Then she stretched out a hand toward the left side of his chest. Does it hurt here sometimes? Yes, just a bit. She nodded again. We're going to discharge you today. Proshka was overjoyed. His black eyebrows shot up to the ceiling. What? You mean... There won't be an operation? She shook her head and gave him a faint smile. They had spent a week feeling him. They had pushed him into the x-ray room four times. They had made him sit down, lie down, stand up. They had taken him to see old men in white coats until he reckoned he must be in a pretty bad way. And now suddenly, they were turning him loose, without even operating. Sorry, everyone, that was a fly, and it was on my book. I don't know if I killed it, but I hope I did. They had made him sit down. Okay, yeah, got that. We're turning him loose without even operating. Okay, and now suddenly they're turning him loose without even operating? So, I'm healthy, am I? Not completely. These tablets are good, aren't they? His black eyes sparkled with understanding and gratitude. He was glad to see how happy she was, too, that this disease had ended so easily. You can buy these tablets yourself at the pharmacists, but I'll prescribe you something else for you to take as well. She turned to the nurse. Ascorbic acid. Maria bowed her head severely and noted it down in her book. Only, you'll have to take care of yourself, Yevgenia Ustonova impressed upon him. You mustn't walk quickly or lift heavy weights, and when you bend down, be careful about it. Proshka burst into laughter, happy that there were some things in the world even she didn't understand. How can I help lifting things? I'm a tractor driver. You won't be able to work for the moment. Why? Will I get sick leave? No, we'll give you a certificate to say you're invalid. Invalid? Proshka's look became almost wild. Why the hell do I need an invalid certificate? How can I live on that? I'm still young. I want to work. He held out his healthy, coarse-fingered hands. They seemed to be begging for work. But Yevgenia Ustinova was not convinced. Go down to the surgical dressing room in half an hour. They'll have your certificate ready, and I'll explain it to you. She left the room. Maria, lean and unbending, went out after her. Immediately, several of the patients began talking all at once. Proshka asked about his invalid certificate. What was it for? He had to discuss it with the boys, but the others were discussing... Federal. They were all thunderstruck. Here was an unmarked white, smooth neck that didn't hurt at all, and an operation. Putiev turned over on the bed. He kept his legs pulled up and moved his body with his arms so that he looked like a legless man as he turned. He shouted angrily, his face turning red. 
Don't be taken in. Friedrich, don't be a fool. Once they start cutting, they'll cut you to death. Like they've done to me. But Amajan had his opinion too. They have to operate, Federal. They wouldn't say so without a reason. Why do they have to operate if it doesn't hurt? said Dayomka indignantly. What's the matter with you, brother? boomed Kostoglatov. It's crazy operating on a healthy neck. Rusanov screwed up his face, and these cries flew round the ward. But he decided not to offer any rebuke. After his injection yesterday, he had sheared up considerably, because he'd endured it without much difficulty. But all last night and this morning, the tumor under his neck had made it just as hard to move his head as before. And today he felt quite miserable, since it clearly wasn't going down at all. True, Dr. Gangart had come to see him. She had questioned him in great detail on every facet of his condition yesterday, during the night and today. She asked him how weak he felt and explained that the tumor would not necessarily go down after the first injection. Indeed, it was quite normal for it not to do so. To some extent, she had set his mind at rest. He had taken a good look at Gangart. Her face showed she was no fool, only her last name was open to suspicion. After all, the doctors in this clinic were not the absolute bottom. They must have some experience. You just had to know how to make things, how to make them do things. But his mind was not at rest for long. The doctor went away, but the tumor stuck out as before, under his jaw, pressing against it. The patients blabbered on, and there was also this talk of operating on a man's neck when it was perfectly healthy. Rusonov's great lump had been so big, yet they weren't operating and didn't mean to. Could it really be as bad as that? The day before yesterday, when he entered the ward, Pavel Nikolaevich could never have imagined he would so quickly come to feel a sense of unity with all these people, because it was their necks that were at stake. All three of them had their necks at stake. Friedrich Federal was very upset. He listened to their advice and smiled uneasily. They were all so confident when it came to telling him what to do. He was the only one with any doubts about where he stood, just as they had doubts in plenty when it came to their own cases. An operation would be dangerous, but not to operate would be dangerous too. He'd already seen quite a bit and done some investigating last time he was here when they'd used x-ray treatment on his lower lip just as they were doing with Ajenberdyev now. Since then, the scab on his lip had swollen, dried up, and fallen off, but he understood why they wanted to operate on his cervical glands to stop the cancer spreading any further. But there again, they'd operated twice on Putyev, and what good had it done? And what if the cancer had no intention of spreading? What if it had gone? Whatever happened, he would have to consult his wife, and especially his daughter, Henrietta, who was the most educated and decisive member of the family. But here he was taking up a bed, and the clinic would not hang around waiting for replies to letters, from the nearest station to the depths of the steppe, where they lived. Wait from the nearest station to the depths of the steppe where they lived, the post was still only delivered twice a week, and then only when the road was good. To get a discharge and go home for advice would be very difficult, more difficult than either the doctors or the patients who were giving advice to him so lightly realized. To do this, he'd have to get a final stamp on his travel pass from the town Commandantura, here. The pass he'd gone to such trouble getting hold of, 
he'd have to get himself taken off the temporary register, and then he could go. First, he would have to journey to the little railway station, and he'd have to change there into his fur coat and felt boots that were being kept for him there by some kind of strangers he'd met. First, he would have to journey to the little railway station, and he'd have to change there into his fur coat and felt boots that were being kept for him there by some kind strangers he'd met, because the weather there was not like it was here. It was still freezing winds in winter. Then he'd have to bump and jolt along the 150 kilometers of track to his MTS. An MTS, an asterisk, a machine and tractor station that provides collective farms with agricultural machinery. Perhaps in the back of a truck, not even in the driver's seat. And as soon as he was home, he'd have to write to the district, Commandantura, and wait two, three, four weeks for permission to leave the area again. When it came, he'd have to ask for leave from work. And that would be just when the snow was beginning to thaw. The road would be sodden, and the traffic wouldn't be able to get through. Then, at the little station where two trains stopped every 24 hours for a minute a time, he'd have to rush frantically from car attendant to car attendant to try to get onto the train. And when he got back here, he'd have to get on the temporary register again at the local commandantura and spend several days waiting his turn for a place in the clinic. Meanwhile, they were discussing Proshka. After what had just happened, how could anyone believe in superstition? He was the unlucky bed. They congratulated him and advised him to agree to take the invalid's certificate they were offering. They're giving it. Take it. They're giving it so it must be necessary. They're giving it now, but they'll take it away again later. But Proshka protested that he wanted to work. All right. You'll have plenty of time to work, you fool. Life is long. Proshka went to get his certificates. The ward began to calm down. Yefram opened his book again, but he was reading the lines without understanding what they meant. He soon realized this. He did not understand what he was reading because he was disturbed and worried by what was happening in the ward and outside in the corridor. In order to understand, he had to remember that he wasn't going to get anywhere anymore. That he would never change things or convince anyone of anything. That he had only a few numbered days in which to straighten out his life. Only then would the book's meaning reveal itself. The lines were printed in the usual small black letters on white paper, but mere literacy was not enough to read them. Prushka was already coming up the stairs, gleefully clutching his certificates. He met Kostoglotov on the top landing and showed them to him. Look, great round stamps, he said. One certificate was for the railway station, asking them to give such and such a person a ticket since he had just undergone an operation. Unless an operation was mentioned, the patients had to join the general line at the station, which meant they could not get away for two or three days. Another certificate was for the information on the health department in his place of residence. On it was written, Tumor cordis casus inoperabilis. I don't understand, Proshka poked at it with his finger. What does it say? Just let me think, Kostoglatov screwed up his eyes. Take it away, I can think better without it. Proshka took his precious certificates and went to pack his things. Kostoglatov leaned over the brainsters, a lock of hair from his forehead dangling over the stairs. He had never studied Latin properly or any other foreign language for that matter, or any subject at all except topography, 
only military topography for sergeants. But although he'd never missed a chance to scoff at education in general, he'd always used his eyes and ears to pick up the smallest thing that might broaden his own. He'd done one year in geophysics in 1938, and one incomplete year in geodesy from 1946 to 1947. Between them, there had been the army and the war, circumstances hardly suitable for success in the sciences, but Kostoglatov always remembered his dear grandfather's motto, a fool loves to teach, but a clever man loves to learn. Even during his years in the army, he'd always tried to take in useful knowledge and to lend an ear to intelligent conversation. Whether it was an officer from another regiment talking or a soldier from his own platoon, true, he'd lent his ear in such a way that his pride was saved. He would listen as keenly as he could, but pretending all the time there was no real reason for doing so. When he met someone for the first time, he never made an effort to push himself forward or to strike a pose. He first tried to find out who his new friend was, from what background and what part of the world he came, and what sort of man he was. He would listen and learn a lot like this. But the place where he found he could really get his fill was Butyrka prison, where the cells were crammed to overflowing after the war. Every evening, there were lectures given by professors, doctors of philosophy, and people who were experts on some subjects. Whether it was atomic physics, Western architecture, genetics, poetry, or beekeeping. And all these lectures, Kostoglatov was the most eager listener. And at all these lectures, Kostoglatov was the most eager listener. Under the bunks at Krasnaya, Presnya prison, on the unplaned boards of the prison transport wagons, sitting on his bottom on the ground at the stopping places, or in the marching column in camp, wherever he was, he tried to follow his grandfather's motto and acquire what he had never had the chance of learning in academic lecture halls. In the camp, too, he cross-questioned the man who kept the records, a shy, aging little man, a pen-pusher in the hospital department, who was sometimes sent to fetch hot water as well. He turned out to be a teacher of classical philology and ancient literature at Leningrad University. Kostoglatov conceived the idea of taking Latin lessons from him. For this, they had to go out and walk up and down the camp area in freezing weather, with no pencil or paper to be had. The record keeper would sometimes take off his glove and write something in the snow with his finger. There was no self-interest in giving these lessons. It was just that for a brief time, they made him feel like a human being. Kostoglatov would have had nothing to pay him with anyway, but they both nearly had to pay for it. The chief camp security officer sent for them separately and interrogated them, suspecting they were preparing an escape and drawing a map of the area in the snow. He never believed a word about the Latin. The lessons had to stop. Kostogotov remembered from these lessons that the word casus meant case, uh, there's an asterisk next to case, and that asterisk says, As it happens, these Latin words are easily understood by an English speaker, but they would not be by a Russian. The Russian words are quite different. So, let's see. Kostogotov remembered from these lessons that the word kasus meant case, and that in was the negative prefix, core, Cordis. He also knew from the camp, and even if he hadn't, it would not have required a great imagination to guess that the word cardiogram came from the same root, and the word tumor. 
he had met on every page of pathological anatomy, which he had borrowed from Zoya. So, it had not been very difficult to work out Proshka's diagnosis, tumor of the heart, case inoperable. Not only inoperable, but untreatable too, if they were prescribing ascorbic acid. Kostogotov, still leaning over the banisters, was not thinking about his translation from Latin, but about his principle, the one he had put forward to Ludmila Afonseevna the day before, that a patient has the right to know everything. But this was a principle for people who had seen a bit of the world, like himself. What about Proshka? Proshka had hardly anything to carry. He had no property. Sibgatov, Dayomka, and Amajdan saw him off. They had to go carefully, all three of them. One had to watch out for his back, and one for his leg, and the third had a little crutch to help him along. But Proshka walked along cheerfully, and his white teeth sparkling. It was like being back at the camp on those rare occasions when they saw off a prisoner who had been released. Was he to tell him he'd be arrested again as soon as he set foot outside the gates? What does it say then? asked Proshka as he walked past, quite unconcerned. G God knows, Kostogotov twisted his mouth as he spoke, and his scar twisted with it. Doctors are so cunning these days, you, you can't read a word they write. Here's to your recovery, all you boys. Here's to your recovery. You'll all be going home. Home to your wives. Proshka shook them all by the hand. Halfway down the stairs, he turned round and gave them a cheerful wave. He was full of confidence as he went down to death. And that concludes chapter nine. Shit. That sucks. Yeah, I wouldn't tell him either. That's terrible. I think the guy's like maybe late, early 20s. Hasn't done shit. And he's got like inoperable cancer. And they give him a certificate that he can't read. And yeah, and then that. Oh man, that sucks. It sucks so bad. But it is my philosophy. Uh, not knowing is probably better. Um, I'm no doctor, but I feel like if you knew you were going to die, you'd be more likely to die quicker and more painfully than if you didn't. So I wouldn't want to know if I had a terminal illness. That's just my opinion of life. Unless it was treatable, of course. But even then, if it wasn't treatable and shit, I don't know. Jimmy Carter had cancer that went away in his brain. He's like 93. Well, that is the end of chapter 9. Um, fucking awesome chapter. Thanks for joining me, everyone. Uh, if you are on Instagram, make sure to hop over to Periscope. If you just tuned in today, uh, the previous chapters to this book, all eight of them are on Periscope, as I have yet to edit and put them on YouTube. Uh, but I will be doing that soon. Just trying to figure out where to find the time. But uh, thanks for tuning in.